Would you all pray with me? Father God, Lord, thank you for this morning, for watching over us this past week and bringing us safely back here today to praise and worship you. Father, knowing that we could spend the rest of the day in praise of you for what you've done for us, for who you are, for how you worked throughout the ages to bring about your glory, how you saved us from our sins with your one and only son, Jesus. And through your wisdom, through your knowledge, you guide our everyday lives. You watch over every situation we go through. And you're there to care for us, to comfort us, to strengthen us, to give us perspective so we can have patience in situations. All to bring about glory for your name. I pray that this week we'd be given opportunities to be the salt, to be the light, so the world can see and give praise and honor to you. And that those who are searching for you will find you. Uh, I pray and ask for guidance this week and strength and patience, endurance and perspective. So we will be examples for those around us. Thank you for this morning, the chance we have to be together. What an encouragement it is to be here with one another. And we get our encouragement from you and our hope from you. Let us pass that on to one another. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Lake Mount. As always, it's wonderful to be here with you this morning. And if you're new here or just visiting, welcome. We're so glad to have you. We'd encourage you to fill out one of our Connect cards, and you can find those in the back of our church bulletin if you picked one up on your way in. Or else you can take out your phone and head over to our church website and just click on the I'm New tab, and you'll find a digital Connect card you can fill out and submit. Either way, be sure to stop by our welcome desk in the foyer and pick up your free gift just for visiting us today. And be sure to keep checking your bulletins each week for upcoming events. Uh, the Christian workers will be hosting their annual cakewalk and ice cream social this month on Sunday the 23rd, just after evening service. And all the proceeds from that will be going to the Care and Sew Memorial Fund. And I believe they do still need some people to bake cakes for this event and donate those. So if you're able to help out there, please sign up for that in the foyer outside here. And if you'd like some more details on this event or anything else we've got coming up, just head over to the website and click on the Next Steps page, and you'll be able to find whatever details you need and get signed up for events there. And if you need some help with that, just check out the Welcome Desk in the foyer and someone can help you out. And this week's Ministry Spotlight, we're going to talk about the Lake Mount Clothes Closet. Uh, this has really been a great ministry, and they collect and distribute free clothing and personal items to people who might be in need of those things. Uh, this has been really effective at bringing people in from the community and serving them by meeting a need. And it's also given the volunteers a chance to talk with those people and pray with them and show them the love of Christ. Uh, and what they need, as always, is donations of gently used clothing. I think they're especially looking for men's casual clothes and shoes right now. Uh, and they also can always use help sorting and folding on Sunday and Wednesday nights and some extra help on days when they open to the public as well. And they open the first Saturday of every month from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if you're interested in helping out with this, you can speak with Tina Cochran. And you can also head over to the website and go to the Get Plugged In page and fill out the form. And someone will get in touch with you later this week. And it's time for our weekly call to prayer. And this week, I'd like to encourage all of you to pray for opportunities to spread the gospel. Uh, very often, we go about our business and we get wrapped up in what we're doing. And we just miss out on all those little moments when we might be able to have a spiritual conversation with someone or to pray with them or even be able to share the gospel of Jesus with that person. So as Christians, we should always be on the lookout for those opportunities uh, and even be intentional about creating them if they don't come up on their own. So I'd encourage each of us to pray this week that God would put people in our path, uh, that he'd open doors and give us opportunities to plant seeds, and that he would help us to be alert so that we'll recognize those moments and that he'd give us the courage to act when they do present themselves. So please be praying about that in the coming week. And that's all the announcements we have this morning, so we'll go ahead and get our worship service started. Thank you, Matt. Good morning again, everybody. 
Good morning again, everybody. Good morning. All right, there we go. You're all here. You're all with me. Would you stand with me? We'll sing our first song together. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Let's sing the wonderful grace of Jesus together. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most divine. By its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Amen. You can have a seat. That went a lot better than first service. Man, I had some frogs in my throat first service. Woo! You guys all did great out there. All right, we have the uh, guys singing with me and the ladies singing with Heather, Heather for this next song. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will follow. And I will listen. And I will listen. And I will love you. I will love you. All of my days.
holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will follow. And I will listen. And I will listen. And I will love you. I will love you. All of my days. I will sing to the Lord, you are King of Kings, the Almighty God, the Lord is worthy, I will love them, you're the great I am, I will bow down before Him, I will sing to God, you're my saving grace, you will reign forever, you are rich and amazing, you are Alpha, Omega, beginning and end, you're my Savior, you're my Savior, You're my Prince of Peace and I will live my life for you. You're my Prince of Peace and I will live my life for you. Good job. Matthew 26, verses 27 and 28 for our Lord's Supper time. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying... Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's sing Jesus Messiah together. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and he carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah name above all names Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out, all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, all our hope. Name above all names, blessed Redeemer. 
I'm sure, uh, if not most, all of you would probably raise your hand. Loneliness to an individual can be a horrible thing. Unfortunately, everyone suffers from time to time, from children to adults. Currently, the state of our country, there are a lot of people feeling alone due to the virus. Children are unsure if they will get to see their friends in school this year. Some adults have even chosen not to see their children or their parents or their grandparents in fear that they might make them sick. This all leads to loneliness. Looking back at my life, um, there's been some times that I've suffered through loneliness. I know it, uh, I was raised kind of rough by my parents, but they never let me go anywhere on myself, especially when I was a small child. And the first time I actually went away from home, I was about 15 years old, and I went to the Iowa Intensive Wrestling Camp for two weeks. So from never going away from home to being gone for two weeks without seeing anyone, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, it was a, it was a trying time. I think the only thing that saved me was I was so exhausted in those two weeks that I didn't have a lot of time to think about them. Usually I was sleeping in the, the downtime. Um, another uh, lonely time in my life was when I graduated college uh, I had to, I accepted a job in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, at the time I was engaged to my current wife, Beth, who we just celebrated 27 years Friday, wedding anniversary. And I had to spend three months on my own living in an apartment before we got married in August. And it was, it was a real challenge because there was, you know, when I was in college, people were there to cook my meals for me and Pretty much everything I was still being taken care of, whereas when I went away on my own for three months, I had to prepare my own meals. Again, I had to get myself up for work every day, go to work. It just, it was a long evening coming home and being by yourself. I really, it was some lonely times for me. In reality, though, my loneliness in comparison to others is probably minimal. There are many individuals that have lost a loved one here today and are dealing with that great void in their life. But I have good news. Christians are never truly alone. Even in the middle of nowhere or in the midst of tragedy, Christ is always with us. So when loneliness strikes, we must reach out to him. He promised us he would be there until the end of the age. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 reads, The Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Think about this now in regards to communion. He went to the cross for our salvation, and he did it because of his great love for you and I. Do you think then he would cease such love? He cannot, for he is eternal and unchanging. He will not abandon us. In communion, we take the emblems of remembrance, Body and blood, by his great love, he died for us. By the power of spirit, he rose again. Whenever two or three are gathered, he is there. 
look at the sacrifice that he was willing to make for us and know that you are truly never alone. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be gathered here today with fellow Christians and friends, dear Lord. But most importantly, dear Lord, we realize no matter how alone we feel throughout the week, dear Lord, how distant we feel from our Christian brothers and sisters, dear Lord, that we know that you are there for us, to be with us, to guide us. We just ask at this time, dear Lord, that you continue to be with us, dear Lord, as we remember you and all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On our way to the church this morning, my wife looked at me and she said, I'm so happy with our life. And I said to her, so am I. We're we're so blessed. And I I truly feel that way. And I'm sure that most of you feel that exact same way. And um, let's just pray for our communion at this time, or our offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we are truly blessed, dear Lord. You've blessed us with people in our lives that love us, dear Lord. You've blessed us with the essentials, a roof over our heads, dear Lord, and food on our table before us, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we just ask that at this time as we give back, dear Lord, that we give back with an open heart, dear Lord, that we know that you love us and that you're here for us, dear Lord. And we just pray that this offering, dear Lord, as we give it, would further your kingdom, dear Lord, that more people would come to know that your great love and know that they are truly never alone either. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning. It is, uh, it's good to be here. Good to see you guys. Um, I was told after uh, first service that uh, I didn't tell a joke, and it was National Joke Day. Did you know that? It was National Joke Day. Uh, so I, I thought I, I'd fix that, went back in the files and thought, I, man, I'd, I'd find something for you, but it's probably not funny. So uh, here's how we do things. Like when I, when I have a bad joke, you guys at least have to humor me, okay? Uh, so like a fake laugh is perfectly acceptable uh, after a bad joke, okay? And uh, it, it reminds me of the story of a teacher who found one of her students out on the playground. Miss Smith was her name, and she went outside and found little Johnny out in the playground. Uh, and, and she thought she would correct him because he was busy making faces at all the, the other kids. So she went up to him and said, listen here, Johnny, when I was little, uh, my parents told me that if I kept making ugly faces, that it would freeze and I would stay that way. Little Johnny looked up and said, well, Miss Smith, you can't say you weren't warned. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, uh, 
We are, we are in week two of a series that we've called Amazing Grace. And I, I think if we've gotten anything wrong, and there's probably several things we can mention, one thing we've failed to do is talk about grace enough. I, I don't know if we can ever get to the point where we talk about grace as much as we should talk about grace. Uh, and, and so it's when we start to understand that, that we really realize what it means when we sing Amazing Grace how sweet the sound. And I think as we come to understand that, it's songs like that, it's phrases like that, that gain meaning and power as we do that. So last week we talked about God's amazing, saving grace. Today I want to look at a little bit different aspect of God's grace. We are going to be camping out in the book of Titus, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can find that. Now, I I don't know if I asked you if you could look back and remember the name of your favorite teacher. Now, some of you might have to look back a while. Uh, So by the time we're done, maybe you'll have it uh, in mind. But maybe you can remember the name of your favorite teacher, why they were your favorite teacher, what they did that caused that. For me, it was my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Russo. He was my favorite teacher that I ever had, made an impact in my life. I was just a punk kid, and you're thinking, well, you're just a punk adult now. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and he invested in me, he cared about me, he inspired me, he instilled in me a love for history. I'll never forget Mr. Russo, he was my favorite teacher. Now, Titus is going to set forth grace as a wonderful teacher. I believe there's lots of lessons we can learn, lots of ways we learn and grow as Christians. But Paul is going to speak about the teacher called grace. Titus chapter 2, I want to read beginning in the 11th verse. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds." If you would, let's pray together as we dive into God's word. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to worship, not just on a daily basis, but to come here corporately with other believers of one mind, to be able to sing praises to your name, to be able to partake of the Lord's Supper, and to be able to study your word. Father, I pray that today you are honored, you are magnified, above all else. And Lord, I I ask that as we we bring this message, Father, I pray that I might step aside. Lord, I pray that you might take center stage. Lord, I pray that we might be encouraged, that we might be convicted. Lord, every time we dig into your word, we're, we're learning new things. And Father, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you bless our morning to your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace. Grace is a a wonderful teacher. In fact, the the word that Paul uses where he says the grace of God has appeared and it's instructing us that that word instruct or or some versions say teach. It has the the idea of the whole process of training a child up. That's what the idea is. It it involves the, uh, the rearing of a child from birth to whenever they reach maturity. Uh, It it involves encouraging and loving and teaching and disciplining. That's what the idea is when Paul says that the grace of God has appeared and it teaches us, it instructs us. Notice one thing as we get ready to really dive in. Notice that Paul does not say that grace instructed or, or taught. He says it is instructing. It is teaching us, meaning it's an ongoing thing. We don't have a one-time encounter with the grace of God and then are done with it. 
Now, I understand that the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace. When we gave our life to Christ and when we became a Christian, we encountered the grace of God in a marvelous, amazing way. But, but that wasn't the extent of our interaction with the grace of God. You see, it's, uh, it, it's much more than that. Grace doesn't just leave us alone. It continues to teach us and instruct us. We're always in class, meaning I haven't learned it all. Uh, I'm always a student. I haven't arrived yet. So right now, you and I are students in the classroom of grace, with grace as the teacher, and we have to be willing students. You see, when we became a Christian, it was uh, like starting school. It wasn't graduation day. Uh, That was the beginning of the process. That was kindergarten. We're continuing to learn and be instructed and be taught by the grace of God. I think that there's a temptation to strictly think about grace as something that happens in the beginning. Something that happens in the start of our Christian life and not something that we deal with continually, not something we encounter on a daily basis. Next week, we're going to look at the idea of God sustaining grace because not only are we saved by grace, we are kept by grace. We are sustained by the grace of God. But today, I want to talk about the idea of our transformation, of, of our spiritual growth that occurs because we are being taught By grace. That's why Paul says, and I love this, this might be one of my favorite passages that we're looking at. The grace of God that brings salvation to all men has appeared. What what good news that that is for you and me. That saving grace has appeared, but it's not done. It is teaching us. It's instructing us. It's helping us to live better lives, to live more godly lives. So we know this. We know grace is the teacher. We are the student. But what's the subject matter? What is it that we are learning? Because we can look back at the saving grace of God. Uh, I, I believe it means a couple things. First, it means this. God's grace teaches us to, to say no to wrong. God's grace teaches us to say no to wrong. Now, this isn't always easy because I I don't want us to get the idea that grace is all about learning information. So when I say God's grace teaches us, I don't want us to think about textbook. I I don't want us to think about learning Bible facts and like geography and Bible trivia, so you can learn more Bible trivia and impress your friends at a party or something like that. I don't want you to think about uh, that. that. That's important. I, I believe we should grow in our knowledge of God's Word. That should be something we strive for. Every Christian should be a serious, diligent Bible student. The Bible says that we ought to, we ought to uh, rightly divide the Word of truth. We ought to know sound doctrine. We ought to be able to defend our faith, and what we believe. We ought to have this growing and increasing knowledge of God's Word. I love Bible study and learning new truths. There's nothing like that. God's Word's living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And whenever we put down shovel in the Word of God, we come up with gold. I believe that. However, when I'm talking about learning from grace, with grace as the teacher and us as the student, I'm not talking about a lesson for our head. I'm talking about a lesson for our heart. I'm I'm talking about something that's reflected not in our knowledge of God, but in our character, in our conduct, in our daily living. That's why Paul clarifies and says, this grace of God that brings salvation to all men has appeared, and it's instructing us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. There are some things that are hard to say no to, aren't there? There's some things I just can't say no to. For example, I'd have a hard time saying no to a plate of oatmeal raisin cookies. Uh, I have a hard time saying no to a steak dinner. Now, the hint has been given. Uh, And so I I have a hard time. There's other things it's hard for us to say no to. And sometimes sin is hard to say no to. 
Sometimes sin's hard to say no to because we kind of live in a culture that's taught to do what we want to do when we want to do it. We're taught from a very young age this idea, if it feels good, do it. Don't deny yourself anything. And everything's geared towards pushing us in that way. Uh, whether it's television commercials, uh, the idea of the impulse, the idea of delayed gratification is a lost idea. The idea of denying yourself anything you want is a tough pill for us to swallow. So right off the bat, the idea of saying no to something becomes incredibly difficult, not to mention the fact that we face pressure from other people to do things that we might know we ought not do. So saying no is difficult. And the truth of the matter is, sometimes sin, sometimes things that are wrong, have an appeal. And the reason they have an appeal is because it offers some temporary gratification for something. Right, a temporary pleasure, a, a temporary healing, temporary help to some problem that we have in life. But that's the extent of it, isn't it? We know from our experience, and the Bible confirms to us, that sin can only offer temporary pleasure. But even though we know that, sometimes we're quick to say yes to sin, aren't we? Sometimes we give into these desires that we have, gratifying our own flesh. That's why Paul spoke about it. He says, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions. But that doesn't mean it's easy. In fact, it, it, it certainly isn't. Living the Christian life is sometimes difficult. And, and on top of that, I don't ever want us to get the idea that living the Christian life is just about denying ourselves things and living some miserable sacrificial life and that's just the cross we bear i'm going to miss out on all these good things in life because i am a christian that's not the idea of grace teaching us to say no y yes sometimes it takes discipline y yes there is the idea of sacrifice and uh, self-control and self-denial those ideas are certainly there but it also has to do with this idea of a change of desire that as we, as students of the grace of God, looking back at what God's done for us, it means our, our desire changes. What we want to do changes because we're learning from grace. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Romans chapter 5. What a beautiful chapter is that chapter uh, where we learn that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Paul goes on by the end of chapter 5. He makes this statement that's always blown my mind. He says, where sin increases, grace increases all the more. Uh, that's good news. It, it's good news because I need a lot of grace because I have a lot of sin. And, and so do you. Uh, we need God's grace. And Paul is essentially saying, the more and more man sins, the more and more God's grace continues to increase because it needs to cover over man's sin. That is amazing news. And, and so they might have understood that idea. So when Paul gets to Romans chapter 6, there's this logical question. Why does it matter what I do? If that's the way it works, if the more I sin, the more God just pours out grace to cover that, why, why does it matter if I sin? Because grace is there to cover it. Why does it matter if I say no or yes to that which is wrong? And in Romans 6, <coughs> Paul asked the question. He said, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? A real logical question, isn't it? Should we just continue to sin so that grace might just keep increasing? And Paul says, no, that's not the attitude we should have towards our sin, for we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? In other words, Paul's saying, man, it's not logical, it's not reasonable for a, a person who's really been converted to want to continue to sin because your relationship to sin and righteousness has changed in Christ. You've died to sin. Why would you want to go back into the pitch? Why would you want to go back to that? And this is an idea that uh, people for centuries have struggled with. In fact, the book of Jude talks about and warns about those who took the grace of God and made it into a license to sin. I, I think there's a temptation here for us. I, I'm saved. I'm forgiven. I'm not saved by my works or by my performance. Therefore, it really doesn't matter what I do. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The, the Bible teaches those that have been saved by grace, those who are students of grace, are going to be acting in a different way. In fact, the truth of the matter is, grace is something that can be seen. 
Grace is something that we can see in other people. In, in Acts chapter 11, for example, it says, Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God. In other words, th- th- this idea that we can look among a people and we can see the grace of God at work. How? How can you see grace? Well, wh- one way you can see grace is in a change, transformed life. We-, we can see God's grace through the way that we're learning and growing in our decisions. Grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. It teaches us to put them behind us in, in-, in our past. It-, it-, it teaches us to give up things that may give us temporary pleasure. But by faith, we believe and understand they're wrong. Now, I wish I could stand up and explain why everything that God says is sin is sin. I, I wish I could just give a logical defense that, well, th- this is obviously why. Now, there's some things that are obvious. I-, I understand why God warns against promiscuity and sexual immorality. I understand that. That's pretty logical. But then there's other times where I'm like, man, I don't, I don't fully understand that. Well, I don't have to. I, by faith, trust that God, my creator, knows what's best for me. That he understands what's best for me to live my life. And when I'm a student of grace, I'm learning to trust that what God says is better than what I think or even based on what I feel. So here's the point. As we grow, as we spend more time as Christians, looking back and growing in our understanding of God's grace, it should make us want to say no to sin. It it should make sin less appealing. And righteousness more appealing. And and this should be a progress. It it should be something that we're increasing in, that we're growing in throughout time. Grace teaches us the truth about sin, doesn't it? Grace teaches us the truth about sin. And, uh, And I think that we get confused about sin because the truth of the matter is sin, I think if we boiled sin down, we might say sin is a lie. It's us believing a lie. That sin's going to satisfy something. That sin's going to make something better in our life. And we sin because we've believed a lie. We bought into a lie. Now sometimes we might be able to see clearly. We might be able to understand that. But that's how it worked with Eve in the garden, wasn't it? She gave in because she bought into the devil's lie. That this was going to make you wise like God. Knowing good from evil. That this was good for her. This would advance her. This would help her. And we do the same thing, fill in the blank with whatever the sin is. And and I believe that when we're students of grace, we start to learn that sin doesn't give us what it promises to give us. Sin's disappointing, isn't it? You ever been there? You you ever think that life is incomplete because there might be something that we might say is sinful, is lacking, so you indulge, you give into it, and then from hindsight you look back and you're like, man, that wasn't as good as they promised. The, the, The pleasure... The joy, the fulfillment was only temporary. And we find that to be true. Whatever it is that the world is offering us, telling us it's going to make life better and more complete, that's just a lie. And as we're students of grace, we learn that sin deceives us. Sin is a a trick on our lives. So we have this growing desire to do what's right. In fact, the Bible teaches that our conversion... Our conversion should mean a weakening desire to do what's wrong because we've come to understand what is wrong. Now, when we think about grace as a teacher, we understand that grace does not teach us what is wrong. The Bible does that. The Bible tells us what's right and wrong. So in order to understand right from wrong, you have to look at what the Bible says. But grace does help us, looking back, to have a stronger desire To not do wrong. To say no to ungodliness. Grace teaches us that grace isn't cheap. It teaches us that grace isn't cheap. And while we can have confidence that salvation by grace is enough. We can trust in the grace of God that it is good. And we have to understand that salvation is not cheap. It's free. There's nothing you can do to contribute to your own salvation. Your justification. Salvation is not free. Uh, salvation is free, but that doesn't mean it's cheap. There's a difference there. The Bible tells us that we were bought at a price, and it's by His wounds we are healed. The cost of our salvation, the cost of our redemption, was the life of the Son of God, 
uh, there's nothing more valuable, uh, nothing more precious than God himself. Uh, as our salvation did not come cheaply or, or easily, and sometimes we forget that. So as students of grace, we look back and we think, this is what my sin cost me. Back in the Old Testament, the way they deal with sin was through like a sacrifice of an animal. Can you imagine what that was like, whether that's a, uh, whatever prescribed time they might have? I, I understand that like when they go to Jerusalem, to the temple, uh, for these big festivals and feasts, and all these pilgrims would come into the uh, land, and they'd bring their sacrifices, that there were literally hundreds of thousands of animals slaughtered there. So why? Uh, can you imagine the mess that that would have been? The stench? The amount and volume of blood and carcasses and just the smell that would have permeated through Jerusalem. And every time they smelled it and every time they looked at it, they were reminded that my redemption came at a cost. That, 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 that sin is messy. And I think it's very possible that we might look back and we might not see the, the messiness of our sin, the cost of our sin. And I think that's one reason why in the church God instituted this idea of a weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. That we might have a time that we look back and remember what God has done for us in Jesus. That His body was broken for us and He poured out His blood for us. You see, grace teaches us that grace certainly was not cheap. And we have this growing appreciation and thanks for what God has done. And one reason why we learn to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions is, I, I want to please God. Now, I get it. I, I don't get it right all the time. E even those of us that love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength that want to please Him with every fiber of our being, sometimes... Sometimes the old man comes up and sometimes we do things we shouldn't do and say things we shouldn't say. Sometimes we miss the mark, but we should have a growing intentional desire to do what's right, to be growing closer to him on a daily basis. In other words, I think there should be this noticeable, tangible difference in our lives throughout time. So if you were a student in school, you would be tested to see if you've progressed you would see some way that you're learning the material that you're grasping the information that you are advancing alongside your peers you would take a test or a quiz or some standardized test in order to assess whether or not you were learning the lessons so what if we were just to take a test a quiz to see if we're learning the lessons in the classroom of grace what would the test look like I think as we look at our lives, we would have to start with the idea not just of our knowledge, but of our conduct, of our behavior. Is our, are our lives increasingly becoming like Jesus? Are we more like Jesus today than we were two, three years ago? Do we have an increasing desire to please God and to flee from sin? And if not, then we might have to have some questions. We might have to do some hard examination. Because I, I think it's possible that if there is no life change, it might be indicating that there's a problem at the start, at, at the very beginning. Meaning, if we're saved by grace, if we look back at what God's done for us, that must do something to us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. In, in other words, here is what it means if... If we come forward one day and we confess Jesus as Lord of our lives and we go back in the back and we baptize somebody into Christ for the remission of their sins and they come out and there's never a change. There's never a change of conduct. There's never a change of desire. There's never an increased hatred for sin. Then there's a problem there. There's a problem there from the very beginning. And while I can't judge the motives of an individual's heart, I do believe we can see something reflected in the after, something reflected afterwards. When Paul says that grace has appeared and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness or uh, it teaches us, some versions say, to deny. That, that word means to repudiate, to, to disassociate, to reject our association completely. 
So the question is this. Do you repudiate, do you reject, do you disassociate from sin? We might not do it perfectly, but we should be doing it progressively. We should be growing more and more through time. And, and, and I think it's possible. It's possible that we have people in the church and they feel very good about where they are because they've done what we said they need to do in order to receive God's amazing grace. But it's possible that that's never made an inward change. You see, conversion is not just about going through actions, hoping that maybe, maybe something will change in our lives, but, but it should be reflected daily in our character. It should be reflected in our desires, our desire to pursue what's right, our desire to flee what's wrong. So as we do introspection, as we take the test, uh, as we are in the course with the teacher of grace, how are we doing? Are we being instructed to say no to ungodliness? And if you look back at your life and there's never been a change, you've never learned to say no to sin ever at any point in time. There's not that desire to flee sin and pursue right. There's a problem there. And and the problem is at the beginning. The problem is at at the start. and, And maybe there needs to be some honest, serious questions that are asked about the starting line. Second thing is this, God's grace teaches us to say yes to what's right. I don't ever want anyone to ever get the idea that being a Christian is just about not doing bad things. That's a part of it. There are certain things that the Bible makes absolutely clear are not proper, not appropriate for God's people. I'm not ashamed to talk about that, mention that, or speak about that. God's people are called to be different. We're called to flee from sin. And there are some things that we should not have or allow in our lives that are not appropriate for us as believers in the Lord Jesus. But being a Christian is not just about avoiding bad things. It also involves doing the right thing. It, it, It involves pursuing What's right. So grace teaches me, it helps me to learn why I should say no to sin, but also teaches me to learn to say yes to what's right. To have an increasing desire to pursue righteousness in my life. And and, and I love the idea that Paul speaks about at the end of our our text. Uh, it, It talks about the idea that he has redeemed us from every lawless deed. The idea there is that uh, not only have we been forgiven, but we've been redeemed from it. Meaning we don't have to live under the power and control of sin any longer because we've been redeemed from it. We've been set free from sin's grip and from sin's grasp in our lives. We've been redeemed from lawless deeds, so we don't have to keep coming back and living in them constantly. And he says this. He says, so that he might have a people. His own possession. Zealous to do good deeds. You see, God's people, as we're growing, as we're increasing, we should have an increasing, not a decreasing desire to serve. An increasing desire to do what's right. An increasing desire to please God with our character and our life. So the question is this, do you have that? Do you have an increasing passion and desire to do good deeds and live a life pleasing to God? Or are you hesitant with that? Or are, are you clinging to the past? Or are you holding on to things that you shouldn't be holding on to? Or are you adding Christian virtues to your life? Or are you adding spiritual disciplines like prayer and Bible study and fasting to your life? Because those things are things not because God said it and I'm afraid of the consequences if I break it, but because I want to please God because I love Him, because His grace so amazing. And that becomes our desire and motivation. You see, I think the difference is in our desire, not necessarily in what we can just see outwardly. The, the difference between a redeemed life and a, a, a hypocritical, unregenerated life is not necessarily in what I can visibly point to and say, aha, you don't have it, or you do have it, and say that. But the difference becomes something inner. It becomes the why. It, it becomes the motivation. Why? Do you do what you do? Do you desire to please God? Do you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? See, grace teaches us to say yes to what's right because we're striving for godliness. In fact, notice what he says. He says that God's grace teaches us to live sensibly, 
that is self-controlled, that is soberly. To live righteously, that is striving to do the right thing. And to live godly lives, that we might be like God. God's grace teaches us. It teaches us how to do those things. And then last, God's grace teaches us to look forward to his coming. I love verse 13 in our text. He says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I I believe that as we grow as Christians, as we grow more like Jesus, so does our desire to be with him for all eternity. So does our desire from heaven. In other words, I think as we grow, I think we become and feel more out of place here than we once did. Now, there might be someone that's a baby Christian, and you're thinking, man, that doesn't make sense. I I don't understand it. I, I understand that. But as we grow and as we mature, I think our longing for heaven increases. The more out of place we feel here. In fact, Peter says that in this world we are just aliens and strangers. You ever look around and you have that sigh inside of you and think, man, this world is not my home. You, You ever have a time where you're just tired of it? Tired of the news stories, tired of the evil, tired of the sin, tired of the anger, tired of the fear, tired of all those things. And you think, I just can't wait for Jesus to come. Because you're a student of grace. And as we're learning from grace, we long for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of his coming. I know we talk about Jesus' coming, and sometimes I think we just talk about it, and it becomes very cliche. It it becomes just the thing we say. So I might say, Jesus is coming again. And you think, amen, and you believe that. You believe he's coming again one day. You believe he's coming soon. You believe his coming could be imminent. But maybe in the back of our heads, we don't really believe he's coming today. But what if? What what if his coming was today? Why not? You ever go outside and look at the clouds? You just look up and you think, What if Jesus was to return right now? Do you long for that? Do you desire that? Because I believe as Christians, that should be our desire. There's a reason why in the New Testament, there's a prayer that's simply one word in Greek, and it's Maranatha. Even so, come Lord Jesus. You ever pray that prayer? When we were in college, we attended a local church not far from campus, this was a a very small traditional church. And by traditional, I mean every Sunday they did the same thing, the same way, the same people did the same things, the same way, every single service. They'd take up offering, and after offering they'd sing the doxology. Every single week you could set your watch by it, and to close their service, they always sang the same song. And I love the words to it. It said, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Maybe the test for us might be, when we hear that, what's our first response? Is that joy? Is that excitement? Is that something that we have this eager anticipation of? Are we like, not yet, Lord. Uh, is there some element of fear and dread? Or is there a moment of excitement when we think about that? Because as students of grace, it teaches us to look forward to his coming. I love the way Paul words it. He says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. If anyone ever tells you that the Bible never claims that Jesus was God, You can take them to the book of Titus and to chapter 2, where Paul says that Jesus, his coming means he is the great God and Savior. And, And those two seem like an odd mix. God, who is Savior. I I know of no other religion that has this idea of God making himself the Savior, the sacrifice, the atonement. For our sin. But that's what Paul's saying in Titus. Our great God 
and Savior, Christ Jesus. So here's the question for us. We're students in the classroom of grace. As we look back on the time we made the decision to follow Jesus, have we progressed? We all grow in different ways. And there's lots of reasons for that. But if that's the case, and this is a lifetime journey, what grade are you in? There's some people that have repeated the same grade over and over again. That's a problem. And it causes us to have to do some introspection. Maybe today that means that we look back in our own lives. And we look back and we ask ourselves, man, on that day I... I gave myself to Christ and was baptized. What was going on? I I can't decide that for you. Only you can decide it. But, But I do think that there's a lot of times that the problem that exists is a problem at the beginning. It's not just that there's a a character problem here and a character problem there. Oftentimes there's a conversion problem. And, And I think what we see a lot of times, why do we see Christians doing such bad things? It's because many times they're Christians in names, but they've never been converted. I'm not saying that's the case with you. I'm not saying it's not the case with you. I'm just saying that when we experience the grace of God, it demands something of us. It demands a life change. It demands that we are eager, willing students. And as a willing student of grace, I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to be corrected. I'm I'm open-minded to what God's word has to say about right and wrong, and I want to do what's right. I don't always get it right. I fail miserably sometimes, but I desire to do what's right. I desire to say no to ungodliness and yes to righteousness. Is that your desire? Are you growing in grace? Are you learning the lesson? Today, we're going to sing a song of decision And as we do this, it requires us to think about our own lives. So it it requires a couple things. Maybe you look back at your life and you think, man, I'm not so sure that uh, that I got it. I'm not sure I've ever got it. Maybe you've been in the church for years and you've done what you're supposed to do, but it's never changed anything. If that's the case, I'd love to talk with you. Our elders would love to talk with you, pray with you, study with you, and help you along the way. That doesn't necessarily have to be a public decision. Maybe it's one where you just need someone to talk to for a while and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling. Or, or maybe you've been a Christian. You love the Lord, but you've gotten off track seriously. And grace is teaching you to start saying no to something and start saying yes to something. Maybe today you need to make the decision to follow Jesus. It, it, it's not an accident that when Romans chapter 6, Paul asked the question about grace He goes on and reminds us of our conversion, of our baptism. And he said, no, we died to sin for... We we were buried with him in baptism, into death. And we were raised with him to walk in a new type of life. Maybe today, you need to make that decision. To encounter God's grace at the very beginning. We're going to stand and sing a song of decision. If you need to come forward, we invite you to come. Let's stand and sing. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am. prayer you guys have a wonderful afternoon let's pray father thank you so much for all you do for us lord help us to be constant diligent students of grace give us a humble spirit to 
accept correction. Give us an open mind to learn. Lord, help us to conform to your likeness, to be like our teacher as willing disciples. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, we praise your name. 